Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Sunday Night Live. And uh, yeah, you're probably wondering why I put up a, a sign saying we will remember them lest we forget. Here in the UK, it, it is Remembrance Sunday, uh, in which we remember all of our fallen and wounded combat veterans, um, both dead and wounded, uh, in all combat since 1918. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of what today was all about. And um, coming from a military family, that's a big thing for me. It's a big deal. Um, my um, grandfathers on both sides of my family um, fought in World War II. And before them, their fathers fought in World War I, and a number of my uncles fought in World War I and were killed in action. So, um, yeah, remembering them is a big deal for me. If you remember back to last year, um, I made a big deal of it then, and so, yeah, it's a big deal for me to make sure that I remember and make sure that we all, who are subscribers to my channel, that we all remember them too. And remember their sacrifice for us that means that we can live in a world that is uh, relatively free, actually. Particularly in the Western world, we enjoy a lot of freedom that was won for us by those that fought and died and bled and were wounded uh, on our behalf. So, yeah. And you guys in the United States, you have your Veterans Day as well. So, uh, it's important for me to remember what they did for us and remember um, their sacrifice. So, yeah, that's why I started with that little slide that says we will remember them, because if we don't remember, and if we do forget what they've done for us, and we, uh, like some younger people around today, they mock old people, particularly old men, they will mock them as sad, lonely old men, and they will laugh at them. What they don't realize is, is those men, by and largely, were heroes and have done incredibly brave things that mean we have the freedom to be able to say such things about them. And they are so humble that they don't argue back and they don't fight back, even though they should. They don't. And so it is up to us to make sure that every generation, whether they are four or five, six-year-old kids, and I forgot to turn off my notifications, four, five, six-year-olds, um, or whether, you know, they're 15, 16, 17-year-olds, we need to make sure that they never forget. Because when we are dead and buried and our lives are done, they're going to be the next generation of mature adult people, hopefully mature, but certainly adult. And if they don't continue this act of remembrance and not just going through the motions of it, but actually genuinely remembering what they did and the fact that they sacrificed, they put their lives on hold, not knowing that they would ever come back, whether they'd come back in one piece or come back at all so that we could have have a world that is relatively free and relatively peaceful. So that's a big and important thing to me. So that's why this kind of time of year, it's usually the nearest Sunday to November 11th. Now, you're probably wondering, particularly those of you that are in the United States, you're probably wondering, hey, why do you guys observe November 11th? Well, the reason is, is that the armistice that was signed at 05.30 hours in a train carriage in the Forest de Campagne in France that ended the First World War came into effect on the 11th hour. So at 1100 hours on the 11th of November, 1918. And so we remember, um, because that's the moment that the, the end of the Great War happened it came into path it came into being the end uh the guns finally fell silent 
And so here in the UK, we've been observing that since 1919, and particularly is focused around the Cenotaph Memorial Monument, monument in London, uh, which was unveiled in 1921. But the concept has been in existence since uh, November 11th, 1919. And we've been doing it every year ever since. And hopefully we'll continue to do it, even once the final World War II veteran has died. Hopefully we will continue to do it. That would be my personal opinion. But with that all said, yes, just Bob, this is just uh, like our Veterans Day. Yeah, pretty much exactly the same thing. It's just that our day kind of ties in with the end of the First World War. Uh, but if we don't just think about those that died in the First World War. We think about those that died in World War Two in Korea, in Vietnam, and in every other combat action that has taken place ever since. So even up to the present day. So that's kind of what we remember on November the 11th. Uh, the nearest Sunday to it. So what will happen uh, on the day itself, on November the 11th, if it's not a Sunday, there will still be a two-minute silence that most people will observe. But um, the formal observation of it is done on the nearest Sunday to it. All right, so um, I'm actually going to remove that post. Uh, this is not politics. This is about remembering our our war dead. It's not about Democrat, Republican. It's not about Labour or Conservative or any other political party. This has no affiliation to any political party, and neither should it. And if it does, then the whole meaning of the whole thing is lost. So I hope you understand that. All right, let's get that out of the way. And let's move on to music, uh, music production, because that's what we're here for. You guys are not here to hear me pontificate about remembrance, so not going to do that. All right, so uh, welcome to Sunday Night Live, 10 minutes into the show. And we've got about, uh, we did have about 21 people in here, but as soon as I started pontificating, a whole bunch of people left because they, you know, but anyway, if you left because of me talking about Remembrance Sunday, meh. Okay, that's on you. That's not on me. Um, but if you're still here, wonderful. I'm glad you're here. Welcome, one and all. And Just Bob was the first one in the room saying hello. He says, love the sound of today's rock recordings in your face, loud and balanced, but I miss the organic sounds and realism of such songs as High Roller from April Wine. April sounds much more real. Yeah, anything that, that was recorded, to be honest, my personal opinion, anything that was recorded on on tape machines or mastered to tape machines uh, sounds fantastic. And anything that actually preserves the dynamic range of the music, I think, sounds fantastic. Anything, you know, that kind of is a bit loudness wars, meh, they don't sound very nice. They really don't. They sound too crispy, and there's no, there's no uh, difference between loud and quiet, you know? The ear needs to have that difference between loud and soft um, to keep the music engaging. That's why that's why classical orchestral pieces have louds and soft, particularly anything from the Romantic period, you know, kind of Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and uh, Mahler and all of those people. Um, they have massive dynamic contrast between exceedingly quiet that it's barely audible to ear splittingly loud. And sometimes within a couple of measures or bars, or even like half a bar, it can go from extremely quiet to extremely loud. Uh, and, you know, that's important. That's what keeps the listener engaged. Because, n you know, music that is completely at a monotone and does not change in loud and quiet and is always like this, I mean, I'm not talking about necessarily on the same pitch, but is at the same volume, it becomes very fatiguing. And you can only listen to it for a short time. And that's just science. That's just how the brain works. So, yeah. Anyway, I do have a little subject for tonight. And the reason I'm going to do this is because somebody emailed me and asked me. I've been asking you guys for weeks, if not months. If you have an idea for a show or you have 
something that you would like me to focus on for a show, email me. Tell me what it is. And I would like to build up a nice little collection of ideas for shows so that I can do them. I can just line them up and do them one after the other until we're done. And then just keep sending me the ideas and we keep making this all about you guys and all about what you want to see rather than my crazy wild ideas. So somebody has actually asked me if I would do this and today it's all about bass playing and guitar. I'm not really a guitar player. I'm not even a fake guitar player. I'm a fake, fake guitar player. I do have a guitar. I will plug it in and I will show you what I do with it. Um, but I am much more of a bass player and a piano player and a vocalist than I am anything else. Those are kind of my main three things that I do. So, um, so yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, um, bass and how to get a good bass tone. Um, and it's going to be a little hard to demonstrate because of the way my loopback system works. So, um, I'm going to use Ampire and hopefully you guys are going to hear the different uh, tones and different settings you can get out of Ampire for bass. It is much improved thanks to a number of bass players who have been making requests. Mm, yours truly included. I have made several. Uh, so hopefully we will uh, be able to go through that and you guys will be able to uh, hear um, what I'm doing. So. I hope that's okay for you guys. Uh, I know maybe it's a little self-indulgent being that I'm a bass player, but see, these things are important. And one of the one of the parts of the question was, you know, how do you do this going direct into your interface without getting any clipping? Because there are some people who they plug their guitar straight into their interface, and even if they have the input gain turned right to zero, it still clips. <laughs> Uh, and that's probably to do with the, the actual gain and volume on your actual guitar, or if you're going out of your amp into your interface, it's probably the gain going out of your amp into your interface that's creating that problem. Um, so I have my Jaco Pastorius bass here, and it is plugged straight into my Studio 1824, and it is going into Ampire. And uh, I'm going to play a little bit and I'm going to show you kind of some of the ways in which I try to dial in a reasonably good bass tone. Um, uh, now, because of the way loopback works for OBS, you're probably going to hear it after the fact. So after I've recorded, you'll be able to hear the bass tone that, that I've had. Otherwise, we're going to get some doubling between my live input into the interface and what is then going back through loopback through Studio One and into OBS. So I hope you guys understand that. Uh, getting a good virtual bass is an art, one that's hard for artists to capture. Yeah, I'm not talking about virtual bass, I'm talking about the real thing, dude. An actual physical bass with strings on it. In this case, it doesn't have any frets, but it certainly has strings. Um, but you're absolutely right. Doing a virtual bass on an actual keyboard using a, a VST bass is in fact any virtual instrument that uses samples of real instruments is hard to get to sound natural and not like it's been programmed there is definitely an art to it and you have to actually think like somebody playing the real instrument in order to we in order to make it work like if you're doing a trumpet part there's no good you playing down kind of outside of the register of the instrument either too high or too low because it's a dead giveaway. And also playing really long lines or really long notes that unless you can circular breathe, no trumpet player is going to be able to play. <laughs> so yeah, it's, you know, those are things to think about. All right, so let's get into some bass playing and then we're going to do some Q&A afterwards. So I'm going to keep this relatively short and just give you a couple of different things that you can have fun with and explore. So uh, let's go over to Studio One. Let me get that set up. There we go. All right, so here we go. Let me grab my bass. And 
At the moment, you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm completely uh, tangled up in my cables. <laughs> I have my headphone cable tangled up with my bass line into my interface. All right, so. <laughs> Hopefully you guys can hear that. Uh, yeah, hopefully you guys can hear that. Uh, so, uh, you guys can't see me, and you can't really see what I'm doing. What kind of bass is everyone here playing? I am playing a Fender 1962 Fender Jazz bass with no frets, so fretless. Uh, I have been a fret... Um, I played fretted bass for a long time, but I come from an upright bass background, which is why I much prefer playing fretless, but there is definitely an art to playing fretless uh, electric bass than there is playing uh, um, an upright bass. Okay, Dwayne says he can hear it. Good. All right, so I have, thanks to the uh, Tom Breckline V1 stereo drum loops, I have some drum loops which I can play along with. And we can see what we can get with our nice bass amp. So let me show you what I'm doing with that. Hang on. Come on, Mr. Console, open up. So let's close that, close that. Let's go and get Empire. And we're gonna go and get some bass tones. We're just gonna use the clean stack just to start with, which at the moment you're not gonna hear. But if I do, if I do this, Gonna get a look. We probably have a little bit of doubling between the live input and uh, the amp here. All right, let's get some uh, drums going. Nice bit of a funky bass thing going on, a funky drum loop going on. Quite a few uh, weird, weird ones as well. So that's kind of a little bit of a weird one. Distortion. See what else we got here. Um, and these are some that I've never even played before. Didn't even know existed. Thank you. 
I think that's meant to kind of like have like um, an octave thing going on under it. So it sounds pretty nice. Now we got this one. Which is a little more suited to the, um, the kind of gnarly uh, kind of. Let's see if we've got anything more distorted than that. Try this one. Kind of a bit weird. Uh, let's see what else we got. That's a little bit crunchier. Uh, what else? We got? That's quite clean. Uh, what else we got? I've not tried yet. So yeah, so you can get some uh, some quite nice um, sounds going. I've not tried all of these. Um, but yeah, some of these are quite fun to muck about with. This one's quite nice if you're just into like weird stuff. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, let's see. Just Bob says, "How are you making the volume of the bass push through without clipping? Either I clip within Studio One on, or or I clip on my USB ninety six and turn the incoming and turning the incoming down. You can't hear." Uh, <laughs> What I'm doing is actually pretty simple. And I should probably just go over to the screen so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, I basically have, here's the base. And it, there's the input cable. And that is going straight into input two on the 1824. And I have the, 18, the uh, input control set to 12 o'clock. Okay. And then I have the volume control on here. The first thing I do is I crank it and then I dial it back. So if I crank it all the way up, now we're getting some clipping going on. So I dial it back maybe like half a turn or a quarter of a turn. So, yeah, so that's essentially what I do is I just kind of, uh, if I just make this a little bit more clean, let's just go back to the clean stack. So no, none of the weird effects going on. So uh, all I'm doing is really I just dial back the input on the, uh, on the base and on the interface until what I have is not clipping, but it's still a healthy kind of level signal wise. I have no DI box, but if you find that your particular base, whether it's passive or active, uh, is just generating an awful lot of gain so that you, you kind of like, you almost have your volume control on your base turned all the way off, then uh, you probably just need to kind of do a little bit of a balancing act between how much gain you have and how much you have at the interface level. Um, and I'm only actually using one of my two pickups. I'm only using the back pickup, which is kind of traditional for the kind of Jaco Pastor, uh, Pastorius sound. But if I kind of bring in the front one as well. And now we're getting a bit more of a, a rounder sound. Which is kind of a little bit more suited to rock and roll, maybe. And that, see, that's clipping right away. So if I dial that back. not clipping anymore uh, although I am clipping a little bit in studio one I just kind of noticed that but that might that might have been at the start let me just check no that's pretty good level going in is actually pretty good all right so uh, let's turn that back pick up off there we go back to my kind of thinner gnarlier kind of tone that I much prefer and let's actually record something into this loop. Uh, just because I should, because I said that's what I was going to do. And then we'll muck about with the, the sound of the amp after the fact. So let me get my click set up. Yeah, my count in and stuff. That'll do. That will do. And we will 
just roll this back to there and we'll leave that section instead so we'll turn the click off now there we go turn the drums down a bit so you can hear the bass a bit more clearly Now, of course, the other thing you can do, the other thing you can do is, especially if you're using an amp sim like Ampire, is there is a volume control actually on Ampire itself uh, that you can adjust. So, you know, if whichever channel you're using, one or two, you can certainly dial this back as well, and you can dial your output overall back as well. Um, so, yeah, if you find that you're clipping on the input stage here, then just turn your input down uh, on your interface until it's kind of around that kind of magic kind of minus 12 ish kind of level and You can always gain stage it a little bit after the fact uh, and then the other thing you can do is it, uh, If it's kind of clipping going in here, you can dial this input back as well So the input going into the amp is not too hot and you can always balance it with the output control as well so that you get a good solid signal going both in and out of Ampire um, and it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to mix that way um, and you can also you know you can adjust these settings here and of course you've got the you know the full pedal board down the bottom here which I'm not using at all um, which might help um, you know you might want to stick a compressor on there um, going in uh, or you might want a little EQ pedal or something like that. Or you might want a little reverb or a bit of wah-wah or something crazy like that. Like maybe, um, you know, whatever takes your fancy to, to jazz it up a little bit. I'm going to close that bottom section because I'm going to just keep this nice and clean. Certainly for this kind of a tune, I would keep it nice and clean. But if I had a different song... Um, yeah, backing off the volume can on the guitar can change the tone. So you have to strike the right kind of balance between how loud the the bass is itself going into your interface. And you can use your interface as well to help with that. So, yeah, you you have to do a lot of experimentation. You know, I, I have found that I might spend, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe even longer... Uh, dialing in my volumes and dialing in my tone before I even start recording anything. So that would be my advice, is kind of find that sweet spot. And once you've found that sweet spot gain-wise, then you can go to town on your actual amp sim uh, to find the right balance of the input going into it and going out of it after you've gone through the simulator and all the pedals, if you're using any pedals, that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah. But yeah, it sounds pretty good, actually, Ampire. Uh, for, for the longest time, the bass amp sim on Ampire sounded horrible. <laughs> it, well, it just really wasn't the best. I mean, it's a lot better now. It's, it's, it's definitely heading in the right direction. But for quite a while... Uh, I didn't actually use Ampire at all. I used this guy, the Brainworks Rock Racks V3 player. You can't really do a whole lot with it because you can't adjust any of the tone controls or anything like that. Um, but I did also have Guitar Rig 5, which I don't have anymore. Um, but this is actually the, the bass amp sim that's in the, the Brainworks Rock, uh, Rock Rack, the, the player version. So it's just the demo version. Uh, actually, it sounds pretty good without actually doing anything to it, really. 
you know, without actually being able to do anything with it. Just, it sounds pretty good as it is. So, um, that's another option. Is there a compression pedal? Yes, there is. Uh, let me go show you that, Diego. Uh, if I open up the stomp boxes at the bottom, and if I was to grab that open there, uh, this is brand new to Studio on 5.1. So if you're not upgraded to 5.1, you won't you won't have access to this this guy here, the compressor. Uh, and I've got that instantiated now. Uh, and so you can kind of do whatever you want. So yeah, so there is a compressor pedal in there now. Uh, I don't tend to use it all that much, if at all. Uh, and I can turn that off, because I don't tend to use it. Uh, but yeah, so I hope that that has helped quite a bit. I'm going to put the bass down now. And we can fiddle about with the sound after the fact. So let's actually turn off record enable and monitoring. There we go. Straight up my chair. There we go. So I hope that that's been uh, useful to you guys. And I'm happy now just to kind of take some general questions. If you've got any, if you've got still questions about the subject, then I can certainly take those. And if necessary, we'll go and grab the base again. Happy to do that. All right, let's go back and see what we've got. Uh, try some Empire Tube Drive in pre-mode. Uh, yeah, I could certainly do some of that. And some Base EQ, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have any IRs at the moment. But yeah, I intend to go and get some, but I don't have any right now. Uh, let's see. I really like what I'm hearing. I could listen to you doodle around all night. Cool. Thank you, Duane. I appreciate that. That's very kind. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Mika says, your bass tone is great. Cool. Well, that's without really dialing anything. <laughs> it just happens that uh, this is an, um, a 1962 Fender Jazz bass and just sounds awesome plugging it straight in. <laughs> it really just does. <laughs> I mean, even if I turned Empire off, it would still sound really nice. Um, albeit the strings are a little bit old. The ones that I've got on there now are about um, a year old. So they're past their best, and they, they sound a little bit dark. Um, I really need to change them up. But I'm not really gigging at the moment, so I'm being a little bit more laissez-faire about my string management at the moment. But normally, um, a, a pair of uh, a pair. A set of strings would last maybe six months tops, um, maybe four months, and then I'd and then I'd uh, boil up a new set and then put them on. Um, but yeah, I haven't changed my strings in in probably a little bit longer than twelve months, maybe even fourteen months, with um, you know COVID nineteen and not being able to play gigs, uh, and not really doing a whole lot of recording sessions at the moment, other than kind of tracks that I'm doing here in-house in the studio um, for my own stuff or for one or two other people I'm, I'm doing. I'm still, I still have a small little group of clients who are being very kind and, and generous and supporting me and uh, saying, hey, I've got records, can you come and, you know, work on those? So I am getting some session work still. Not as much as before, by any stretch of the imagination, because, you know, people just don't have a lot of money at the moment, naturally, understandably. So, so yeah, so that's, that's really that. Um, uh, let's see. Just Bob says, thank you. Very important lesson. Learning a lot. Well, glad that it's helping you. That is for sure. Um, you really do just have to try and find that sweet spot between how much gain you have going out of the bass or out of your guitar into your interface 
and then the gain control through the interface and then in uh, in and out of your amp sim so you you kind of have to do some gain staging in that kind of in the recording phase um, to make sure that you have it right and you've got enough headroom for when you're doing a little bit heavier plucking with either a, a plectrum or with your fingers um so yeah that would be my opinion and my advice uh let's see the compressor and gate pedal will added to empire in the 5.1 update that's exactly right bill exactly right uh mike says cable management use it <laughs> yeah that's funny dude uh, my base normally lives over there, the other side of my desk, um, and it's normally plugged into my practice amp. It's not normally plugged into my interface, so I've actually had to unplug it there and bring it across. Brainworks Base Dude is also a great amp sim. Yeah, I have heard a lot about that. I don't have it. I should go and really look and see um, about getting it, but it sounds like it's really good. And uh, possibly uh, better than the Rock Rack. Maybe a bit more versatile than the Rock Rack, I would think. Uh, Kyle is out here. He has to run. Sorry, Kyle. Um, but I'm very glad that you are, you are here. Um, and I hope you found it useful. Ampeg SVT2 um, 8x10 cabinet is popular. It most certainly is. I think Jacko even played an Ampeg at, at one point in his career. Um, I think it might have been when he was with Joni Mitchell that he was playing the Ampeg. I don't think he played an Ampeg uh, when he was with Weather Report. I think, I'm trying to think what it was that he played when he was with Weather Report in 76, 77. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but yeah. But yeah, he certainly played an Ampeg when he was with Joni Mitchell. For sure. But really, with Jacko, it didn't really matter what amp he played through. <laughs> he just sounded great anyway. Uh, and that's mostly him and his skills, and also the fact that he was playing one heck of a, an awesome bass. Uh, 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 uh. Mika says he plays a Fender Jazz Active and Passive 70s and 80s Custom. Fender Precision's Carvin. Ooh, nice. Uh, Alembic Series 1, Gibson EB3. Yeah, the Ambilic, I think, um, uh, Mark King is an Ambilic, uh, endorsee, I believe, still. Mike is spot on. That's what it was. It was a PV. Yes, PV. Absolutely right, yeah. I remember now. It was a PV that he played with Weather Report. Um, but he combined it with a different head. It was like a PV cabinet, and I forget what the head was. He had he actually had two heads, and he ran one into the other in series. Um, which I would like to experiment with one day. Uh, let's see... Any more questions, guys? Otherwise, this is going to be a short show. <laughs> but it was quite nice to actually have um, a question about uh, bass playing, uh, which is not really something I get to do. I haven't really, I don't think I've ever played bass on a Sunday Night Life before. So this is maybe a first. <laughs> if it is, that's awesome. Uh, we're starting to lose numbers now. Uh, we peaked at 28, which is awesome, for about five minutes. <laughs> Not that I'm obsessed with such things, but, um, unless there's any other questions, maybe we could wrap it up, or maybe I could just do some more bass playing. Maybe you might like that. Uh, do I have another song? Uh, yeah, I do actually. With which we could get a little bit more modal, maybe.
little bit more. Yeah, 10 inch, 10 inch speakers are a must for a bass amp. Just Bob says, let's hope for more of these type of shows. Well, you know what? I will do the, more of these type of shows if you ask for them and if you give me, you know, some specifics on what you want me to what you want me to show. Can certainly do that. I'd be delighted to do much more focus shows. Uh, alrighty, let's uh, have a little play with something that's a little bit more open and doesn't really have much in the way of chord changes. That's what we got here. That will do. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, just Bob says, more insight to how John Lipsham approaches recording. We'd love to see it. Everyone email your ideas. Absolutely. Please do email your ideas. Johnny at johnnylipshamstudios.co.uk uh, is the place to do that. And uh, just title your email in the subject bar. Myself. Just title it Sunday Night Live. And I would be delighted to do some more focused shows with a different subject each night. So tonight we've done bass playing, bass recording, how to dial in a tone, um, some of the amp options that there are in Empire, and it's getting bigger and better all the time. Uh, presets are being added all the time, so I'm pretty sure that down the line there will be a whole bunch more at some point, who knows? Um, because I've certainly put in a bunch of feature requests for them. <laughs> so, you know, we'll we'll kind of see what they come up with, but uh, yeah, some nice bass amps would be marvelous in Empire uh, to add to the kind of 
the Ampeg kind of SVT style that they've already done. Uh, it would be nice if there was like a PV in there and maybe a couple, maybe a Marshall amp or maybe some, you know, some nice Italian heads. Oh, that would be nice. Stuff like that is stuff that I've kind of put in and we'll see what they come up with. Um, but yeah, if you want something uh, discussed, demonstrated, like we've just done, then please do send me an email. We can go over specifics of sidechain uh, compressing. Uh, we, you know, compressing e uh, reverbs and delays, that kind of stuff to duck them out of the way. Uh, we can go into side chaining to create that nice pumping effect for EDM, stuff like that. Uh, we can go into anything that you guys want within uh, reason. <laughs> like if you're asking me how uh, to record a trumpet, I can tell you that I can't exactly demonstrate it because it would be midnight here and, well, the police would be at the door fairly quickly if I started playing my trumpet or my sax. So, you know, kind of, there are kind of limits to what we can and cannot do, but certainly kind of demonstrating um, mixing techniques, recording techniques, um, arranging your song, uh, that kind of stuff we can certainly do. So. Yeah, please do absolutely email in your suggestions and I'd be absolutely delighted to do some more shows focused around stuff that you have as a kind of burning issue, a burning question, something that you want me to to get into in a bit more detail than just like a, you know, five minute video. So if that's something that you would like, then please do let me know. We got like five minutes left. Uh, so... You know, if somebody's got, like, a last-minute question, then we can certainly, uh, I can certainly answer one more. Uh, John Lake says I could always get into a band because nobody wanted to play bass. Uh, yeah, it's funny you should say that because there are actually, in some, in some parts of the world, there's a little bit of a shortage of bass players. Um, especially good ones really, really good bass players who can play the heck out of a bass. Um, Bobby says, at least we know you can play the bass also instead of the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, I've been a bass player for... since I was about uh, 10, yeah, 10, 11 years old. Um, but I've been playing keyboards for a lot longer than that. I, I started taking my first piano lessons when I was about 9. Didn't really like piano lessons all that much. Um, but I had a fantastic piano teacher who um, was quite happy to uh, to team my unbridled enthusiasm for playing the piano and not really wanting to learn it. And so she helped kind of me focus, um, you know, my my approach, my learning approach to the piano. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've been doing that. F I've been doing that since I was like nine years old. Um, and drums, I've been playing drums since I was like two years old. Um, my dad is a drummer. Uh, he's been playing drums for about sixty-five years, and so um, there were always drums around at home um, because he had like three or four different drum sets which he used for studios and live shows. So there was always a, a drum set set up in one of, you know, in one of our garages. So that's where I started. I just went into the garage, picked up a pair of my dad's drumsticks and started to play. And there was a record player in there. And my dad had all these Buddy Rich records in there and Steely Dan records and Weather Report records. And, you know, my, my mother would wonder where the heck I'd got off to. And that's where I was. I was in, you know, I was in the garage listening to my dad's records and trying to play along on on his his set of drums and it kind of went from there and uh you know my my parents quickly realized that this was something i was serious about and something i was into so they let me have one of the drum sets one of my dad's drum sets and uh it went from there and i was playing every single day before school after school uh, and extra long uh, weekends. Uh, and my mother had 
um, a Fender Jazz bass, Short Neck, uh, which she played from time to time. She's a little bit of a bass player. She doesn't play it, like, extremely proficiently, but, you know, kind of enough to get by uh, on, you know, a few shows when when uh, the requirement was there. So she had a, um, this, this jazz bass, and uh, I started picking that up and having a little doodle. And uh, then there was the school big band, and our school big band didn't have a bass player, and... You know, there was a guitarist in, in that band who had been kind of forced to play bass, and he was not really into it at all. Um, and there was already, at that particular point, when I started high school, there was already a really good drummer who was the drummer in the big band, and I really wanted to be in the big band, so I was just like, okay, I'll play bass. Having never really played it before, I learned, I learned like, all of these big band tunes that we did, and we had, like, about... 70, 80 tunes, and I learned them all on the bass. I learned how to play the bass just by playing in the band, just by rehearsing and figuring out where my fingers needed to go. Uh, and that's kind of where I started when I was like 10, 11 years old. And bam. <laughs> uh, and then in 1997, when I graduated from university, that was it. I went professional and as a bass player, as a drummer, as a piano player. And that was that for me. So there you go, potted history of how I got into bass playing. Uh, Mike says he played through an acoustic 360-361 PP combo bass amp, his main rig in the 70s. Uh, and then he switched to, in the 80s, he switched to the Hartek. Ah, the Hartek. That's what it was he switched to in the 80s. Yeah, I could never remember what it was. So, cool. Thanks for that information, Mike. Very useful. Uh, it was making me nuts. <laughs> See, I thought it was a PV. I was absolutely certain it was a PV. So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. All right. So, I think we will call it there, folks, because it is now 1 a.m. here. Bobby Beer says, I've been noticing more women are playing bass now, and some are really, really good. Yeah, there are there are some really outstanding women bass players, like Tal Wilkenfeld is probably uh, the one who is possibly the more famous now, because she's played with Jeff Beck and Herbie Hancock and, uh, and Eric Clapton and a few others, a few other big name stars that she's played with. Uh, and she has a solo career of her own as well as a uh, bassist, vocalist. Uh, and she's Australian, and she, she is seriously good. The first time I saw her was at Ronnie Scott's with Jeff Beck. I went to go and see Jeff, and uh, Jeff had an all-star band. He had Jason Ribello on keyboards, who is one of my favorite piano players. And he had Vinnie Colliuto on drums, who is just a wizard. And then there was Tal, and uh, she played some awesome bass. She really did. She blew me away. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely some really, really great women bass players out there. Uh, and you'll find that some of them have, have actually played on, you know, really, really classic records that people actually really look up to. And they think, wow, who is that bass player? And they realize, hey, it's a woman bass player. Wow, awesome. Yeah. I wish there were more, I, you know? I really do. I wish there were more women in music, period, to be honest. Um, there are some great women drummers, like um, uh, Annika Niles from Germany. She is amazing. She is an outstanding drummer. Um, yeah, and of course, piano players, my favorite, I think my favorite... A uh, female piano player right now has got to be Diana Krall, although Eliane Elias uh, comes in a darn good second place. <laughs> All right, so there we go. Uh, Fender Bass Men amps are pretty darn good. I think that's the bass amp that we had when I was at high school. And I really liked how it sounded. Tina Weymouth from Talking Heads is another great example, Mike. Thank you for that. <laughs> And she is indeed an awesome bass player. 
for sure. So thank you very much for coming to Base Night here on Sunday Night Live at Johnny Lichman Studios. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, actually. I've really enjoyed it, and it's been great to have an excuse to play my bass for you guys. So thanks for indulging me. Really appreciate it. And all it remains for me to say is a very good night to you all. Have a great rest of your weekend and an, a great week coming up. And I'll see you on Wednesday over on Johnny Gibe's channel, The Home Studio Trainer, for Songwriting Simplified. And I have no idea what we're going to talk about yet, but I will when I talk to Johnny. Um, I'll have a much better idea. So thanks a lot for coming. Good night. <laughs>